Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. We are online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook, Twitter, and check out our YouTube channel. I am Ladaris Cordell. I'm a retired California Superior Court judge and your moderator for today's program. Valerie Jarrett is a senior advisor to President Barack Obama, overseeing the White House offices of public engagement and intergovernmental affairs and chairing the White House Council on Women and Girls. Not only is Ms. Jarrett the senior advisor to the president, she's also one of his closest friends. Since his inauguration back in 2009, she stood by him through the highs and the lows that come with serving in the White House. Together with the President, Ms. Jarrett has worked throughout her time at the White House to mobilize elected officials, business and community leaders, and diverse groups of advocates in efforts to strengthen access to the middle class, boost American business and our economy, and to champion equality and opportunity for all Americans. From ongoing campaigns to end sexual assault, raise the minimum wage, advocate workplace policies, to benefit working families and promote entrepreneurship and early childhood education, Ms. Jarrett has helped the president create a broad coalition of partners to forward a robust agenda. So Valerie, it is such a pleasure to have you with us. We're very excited to have the White House in the house. So <laughs> welcome to the Commonwealth Club Thank in you. San Francisco. Thank you. Yes. It is nice to be back in the Bay Area, I can yes. tell you that. I All spent right. four of the best years of my life just down the road. I don't know why I ever left. So <laughs> thank you all for coming out tonight. This is great. So you are the longest serving senior advisor in the Obama administration, serving Ooh. the president <laughs> since Inauguration Day. So you've been called all sorts of things. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> a few, the Obama whisperer, the night stalker, first friend, the fixer, a la scandals, Olivia Pope, and uh, gatekeeper in chief. Um, so Valerie, do any of these names fit? Well, I tell you, they all sound a lot better than what I saw on my Twitter feed today. Oh. <laughs> you know what, you can't get caught up in the labels. I think the people who meet me and know me uh, don't want to put me in a, sing a single label like that. But uh, that's about all I'm going to say about that. You'll decide at the end of the evening right. what evening you okay. what, today, what label you think fits. How's that? Okay. Well, I will tell you that at the toward the end of the interview. All right. All right? That's good. So that's um, good. Uh oh. So, now I'm nervous. So being um, I, and in my intro, I said you were one of uh, President Obama's closest friends. So yeah. how did you all? How did that happen? How did that happen? Yes. That's a good story. So 25 years ago this month, actually, which seems like yesterday. Um, I received a copy of a resume uh, from a good friend of mine who was the Corporation Counsel for the City of Chicago. And I was Mayor Daly's Deputy Chief of Staff at the time. And across the top of the resume it said, outstanding young woman, terrific lawyer, has no interest in being in a law firm. And I thought, that's my kind of person, because I didn't enjoy being in a law firm either, and had left my law firm after practicing for six years to work for Harold Washington, and I stayed through his successors, and uh, I had just been promoted Deputy Chief of Staff under Mayor Daley. So I called this young woman in for an interview, and what was supposed to be about a 20-minute interview lasted about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half. And at the end of the interview, I was, maybe about a quarter of the way through, I realized I was no longer interviewing her, she was interviewing me. And at the end I said, well, you have the job if you want it, which was ridiculous. I didn't have the authority to make her an offer or anything <laughs> like that, but I was so bowled over by her. And so wise woman that she was, she said, well, let me think about it. So we were talking a few days later, and I said, well, what do you think? By that point, I had permission to give her the offer. And she said, well, my fiance, Barack Obama, doesn't think it's such a good idea. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding? <laughs> He doesn't want you to come work with me? Well, how could that be? So she said, well, he has some concerns about Mayor Daley, and he started his life as a community organizer, and he protested against City Hall, and now I would be in the mayor's office, so he kind of wants to have an idea who would be looking out for me, so would you have dinner with us? And so, 25 years ago, this month, we had dinner, and the rest is history. Wow. She did come and work with me, by the way. Wow, that's, <laughs> great. that's a great story. 
So I, I, as I was doing my research on you and preparing for this interview, I was thinking, wow, this is the dream job, right? Yes. And senior advisor to the first black president. And then I was doing more research and I'm thinking, this is a nightmare of a job. <laughs> you know, on call 24-7, 365, dealing with crisis after crisis and a fishbowl. So which is it? It's a dream. It's a dream come true. I am telling you, at my age, uh, having had a really interesting career, from uh, there's no point in my childhood where I would have thought I would work in the White House, let alone work in the White House for a man who I respect and love and consider like a brother to me. So this is uh, this has been the most challenging, frustrating, uh, rewarding, inspiring, just miraculous opportunity, and it's all it's all of the above. And on, in any given day, in any given hour, it's like a roller coaster. But I pinch myself every day to have the privilege to serve our great country. Well, and you look terrific. So they, the not most wearing important, it down. this is great. <laughs> most important, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Thank you. So you were born and raised in Shiraz, Iran. And you were there for the first five years of your life. Yes, I was. And then a year later, you moved with your family to London. Mm -hmm. You're there for a year. And then you end up in Chicago. Yeah. Um, so my understanding that you're an only child. I am. And so that you and your parents, James and Barbara Bowman, settle in Chicago. So what was it like growing up in the household of the Bowman family? Well, so you got to wonder why these two African-American uh, young adults would decide to go to Shiraz, Iran, right? So my parents are a little crazy. And uh, they would not be upset that I said that. They wear that like a badge of honor. And my father was leaving the military. He was a physician and he served in the military. And he started applying for jobs. You and I had a similar conversation. And he wanted to do research at, at an academic institution. And he couldn't find a job in the United States where he was going to get the same pay as his white counterparts. And so he was really frustrated. And so he said to my mom, well, then let's just go on an adventure. And maybe when we get back, the United States will be better. And so he went to Shiraz, Iran, and he started this hospital, the Namazi Hospital. He ran the Department of Pathology there. And my mom taught. She's an academic, teaches graduate school and early childhood education. And so she taught in the nursing school there. And it was an incredible experience because at that point in time, Iran had great di diplomatic relations with the United States. And the Shah of Iran was very interested in developing best practices in medicine. So he recruited physicians from all over the world to come to Iran. He had a program to just try to set up uh, this really a melting pot of academic excellence and science to make sure that in Iran they were developing the best practices. And so we lived on a hospital compound. I spoke three languages. Everybody, every child there spoke multiple languages. What and languages did you speak? I spoke Farsi, French, and English. Sometimes all in one sentence. <laughs> uh, frequently all in one sentence. You had to keep up with me. And so it was fascinating. But from there, he started doing research that caught the eye of um, a researcher in London. And so then he moved to London to continue this research. And from there, he was recruited to the University of Chicago. And so he often says, you know, sometimes you have to take a circuitous route mm -hmm. to find your way back home. And my mom was from Chicago, so it was terrific for them to actually be able to uh, be there. And he was the first African-American tenured in the Division of Biological Sciences at the University of Chicago. So it was an interesting and what kind of a child? roundabout way. So living in their yeah, household right. with these adventuresome parents was never a dull moment. His research took him through um, most of Africa. My summer vacation, most people would go to camp. We would go to, I remember this, Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, Ethiopia, and then Egypt, and then back to Iran. And that was our summer vacation because he was studying uh, diseases that were genetic based and varied depending upon uh, geography and he was fascinated with Africa and so we spent a lot of our time traipsing around Africa and Mexico and it was a very interesting childhood I have to tell you but it taught me a lot and I'm very grateful for it because there's nothing like living outside of the United States to make you value our country and so much of what we take for granted here 
um, isn't so obvious in other countries and available. But then the other thing I learned is the United States is absolutely the greatest country on Earth. It's not the only country on Earth. <laughs> and you can learn a lot from people who are outside of our country. And um, as my mother used to say, you know, children play, and you don't need to know anything about each other, or you don't even have to share a language. Right. They just they learn how to communicate and play together. And I think uh, that's a great experience to have had to come back and do what I'm doing now. Wow. So which posed the greatest challenge to you as you were growing up, and even now, uh, your gender or your race? Well, that's hard to answer because I'm a woman and I'm black, so I can't separate the two and tell you like which one. I don't really look at them as challenges. And I've, I've always been in professions that were predominantly male, but I've always worked since I left that law firm um, for employers that I think appreciated the diversities of strength. And I always felt that I was valued. And I think that one of the things that I encourage young people who have choices is to make sure you're going someplace where who you are is going to be accepted. And whether it's gender or race or sexual orientation or gender identity, whatever it is, try to put yourself around people who are going to think that you add value because of who you are, not make judgments um, about you. And everywhere I've worked since leaving that law firm has been that way. Wow. So um, after your divorce, you raised your daughter as a single parent. With some I did. help from your parents. Um, a lot of help from my parents. A lot of help. I just want to say that for the record, because right. my mom might be listening one day, right? Right, exactly. Lots of help from exactly. my parents. I was fortunate. That's right. So y you know firsthand uh, the many challenges that, that women face. And one of the many things that so many people admire about you is that Valerie Jarrett walks the talk. Um, on issues impacting girls and women, you've taken a leadership role, culminating most recently in the White House United State of Women Summit. I love that title. Wasn't that good? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I wish I could say I thought of it. I didn't. <laughs> so can you tell us about the summit and what the Obama administration sees as critical issues facing women and girls? Yeah, sure. So uh, a couple of months into the president's first year in office, March of 2009, he created the White House Council on Women and Girls. It's the first time a White House has had a council with representation from every federal agency. And his thought was we wanted to make sure that in all of our programs and all of our policies and all of the legislation that we support, we were thinking first about whether or not it improved the lives of women and girls. And I've chaired the council since its, since its inception, and it has just been terrific because we've worked on everything you can imagine from education and encouraging young girls to go into fields like science and technology and engineering and math to ensuring that we are ending sexual assault on our college campuses, and we launched this It's On Us campaign where we've had 500 events at college campuses encouraging everyone to get involved in ending this culture of sexual abuse on campuses. One in five women are sexually assaulted while they're in college. That's just an epidemic. By any, If it was anything else, it'd be a national emergency. Uh, we focus on entrepreneurship and getting women to think about starting their own businesses, small businesses particularly. I have a challenge getting access to capital, and we're finding that women have a hard time getting that access where actually they're really good investments. Women pay back their loans. Um, sometimes men don't, as a general rule. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> So we, we work on that um, health care, the Affordable Care Act, has wonderful benefits for women. You're now able to go and get preventive care without a copay, from regular checkups to uh, contraception to screening for domestic violence, a whole range of services that are available under the Affordable Care Act, uh, and on from there. And so this summit gave us an opportunity to look at all of the different ways where we have moved the needle, improved the lives of women and girls, and it... Uh, came two years after the summit that you mentioned a couple of the issues, a working family summit, where the whole bucket of issues that are important, not just to women, but because women now comprise half of our workforce, also important to men, families, businesses in our economy. Um, and we have really moved the needle on that. So it's everything from raising the minimum wage, and although the federal government, Congress, Republicans in Congress have not agreed to raise the minimum wage. Cities and states all across America have. 48 cities and states have done it. Cities and uh, numerous states have done it. Uh, paid leave. We are the only developed country in the world 
that does not have a national paid leave policy. How are we going to be globally competitive if we can't not just attract but retain the best talent possible? So again, Congress has failed to act, but cities and states across America are adopting paid leave. You just adopted paid, paid leave, paid sick days here in San Francisco. Um, affordable childcare, two-thirds of our state, it's less expensive to go to an in-state college or university than to try to pay for, for child care. A lot of women elect not to work, not because they don't want to work, but because they can't afford the child care. So that's an issue as well. And then workplace flexibility. Uh, you've got to be able to have some flexibility. I know as a single mom, it was important that my employers realize that there was no one else to take my, doctor, my daughter to the doctor appointment if my dad or my mom couldn't do it. I had to be there. And so having that flexibility, I know, is really important. And then finally, equal pay for equal work. Women still only earn 79 cents on the dollar. I see heads nodding down here. <laughs> Women of color, less, considerably less than that. And that's one of the areas where we really haven't moved the needle. And it's frustrating. And so now our challenge is really to employers to say, look, Congress isn't going to act to, um, in a way that would require you to take a look at your books and figure out if you are paying people equally. So why don't you just do it because it's the right thing to do? And we're asking employers to take that pledge. So that whole area, I think we have put the spotlight on it. And research, interestingly, Judge, is beginning to show uh, that employers who recognize that the 21st century worker needs to have those important values instilled in, their, in the companies or not-for-profits or, or government, governments within which they work. So high, higher minimum wage, workplace flexibility, paid leave, paid sick leave, um, affordable childcare, that whole basket of issues, equal pay. If you invest, then your companies, your businesses, your, um, your much more productive, your workforce is more productive, they're more efficient, uh, it's much easier to retain talent, and in the end, it's more profitable. Mm -hmm. And so we really have begun to drill down on that. So I could go on for another hour and a half about what we've done, but the summit gave us a chance to really take stock of what we've done in these key areas, some of which I outlined to you, as well as the work that lies ahead. Got it. One of my passions is doing what I can to fix our broken criminal justice system. And I think that the majority of Americans, especially people of color and poor people, agree that the system needs fixing. Um, I saw the problems firsthand during my 19 years as a judge here in California. What do you see as problematic in our criminal justice system and what initiatives and reforms have you and the Obama administration promoted to address them? Our system is totally broken, and I'll start with some facts and statistics, but it's truly the human toll that is what uh, keeps me up at night, and I know you saw that practicing law and, and serving on the bench. So we spend $80 billion a year on our criminal justice system, and even in Washington, that's a big number. $80 billion is a big number. Just think what we could do with $80 billion. Uh, we um, here in the United States, we have about 5% of the world's population, yet we have 25% of the world's prisoners. 2.2 million people are incarcerated in our prisons. Uh, it is unsustainable and it's untenable, and so what we're trying to do is to fix the system in, in three buckets, as the president would say. The first is in the community. What are we going to do to ensure that every young child gets a fair shot to achieve their dreams and keep them out of the system in the first place? So that's everything from early childhood education, to breaking that school to prison pipeline, reduce the number of su suspensions and expulsions, because if you're out on the street, I never understood, can we just talk about, I've never <laughs> understood why you punish children who are misbehaving right, by them putting them school. outside of the school. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense, That's right. Right? That's right? It doesn't make any sense. And we have in our society preschoolers who are suspended and expelled from school. Now, you might say, well, why can't you handle a preschooler? But there are some preschoolers who come to school and they're hungry, they're tired, they're scared, they are living in households that are under siege, and they bring that anxiety to school. And if a teacher has a class with 30 students, it's hard to manage them. And so we had a, a forum at the White House recently where we brought in all of the folks, stakeholders, to figure out how to break that cycle of suspension and expulsion. And it requires, it requires social workers. You can't just expect teachers to solve that problem, but we need to keep them in the classroom. And we also have to figure out ways of giving young 
young um, high school age children summer jobs. I think the best experience I had as a young um, high schooler was when I had my first job and I got my first paycheck. And that sense of value and worth that instills in you is so important. And so giving these kids summer jobs. So, and a whole host of other ways of building healthy communities. The second one, and this will, I hope, be something that you experienced as well, is the frustration from mandatory minimum sentences. And we're focusing right now in Washington, and it is in one area where I have been optimistic, although I have reason to be concerned now, that we could actually get bipartisan legislation to reduce mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug offenders. It's a mouthful, but there are prisons are full of people who screwed up a couple of times, even three, and are serving life sentences when they didn't kill anybody, they didn't rape anybody, they didn't even hurt anybody, they, well, not that dealing drugs is good, it's not, but it isn't a violent crime in the way that you would think would be necessary in order to get a life sentence. And so we've been, we have bipartisan support, we have everyone from the ACLU to Koch brothers all working on this. We have House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats all wanna do it. It's a wonder it hasn't happened, other than it's Washington. And now that we're in an election year, my, my kind of optimism is a little bit dampened, but we're pushing really hard to get that through. And then the final piece of criminal justice reform is what happens when the 600,000 people a year who are released from prison each year come out? And that's where employers come in. The number one reason why people go back is because they can't find a job. Uh, and I have met so many people around our country who just want to take care of their children, they want to provide for their families, they want to get up every day and feel that same sense of pride that I felt in a lawful job, and we still discriminate against um, people who've been incarcerated, and we're encouraging employers to do the ban the box where they don't ask them at the front end of the application process whether they've been incarcerated. Let them come in and try to impress you, and then ask them at the end, and you might figure out that, you know what, this person is talented, right. and I know that they are motivated motivated because they really don't want to go back to prison and help break that, that um, untenable cycle. So there's a lot about our system that's broken. A, a couple of other things I would also say, solitary confinement, all of the evidence shows that particularly for young people it has long-term traumatic effects and so the president had directed the attorney general to take a look at our solitary confinement and end it for youths and try to diminish it greatly for adults. So that's an important and we need to reform the juvenile system too so that if you screw up when you're a young person, and let's face it, most young people screw up a little bit, that you don't pay the price for it the rest of your life. It's a lot to a do. A mouthful, a but lot to do. it's yes. a big item on our agenda. It's a lot to do. It has been reported that it was you who advised Barack Obama to give his remarkable speech on race in Philadelphia, and this was in 2008 when he was running for the presidency. Um, and this was when there was controversy over uh, his then pastor, uh, Jeremiah Wright. Uh, so is, is, is it I true? I remember it well. Is it true? <laughs> uh, to remind me about that. <laughs> so if, if it is true, why did you encourage him to speak out as he did? And well, well, just to be clear, he wanted to give the speech, and I told him I thought it would be a great idea. And the reason why is, is that people were confused. People couldn't understand how he could worship in a church um, with a pastor who said such dreadful things. And the best way to confront a situation like that is to just address it head on and tell your story. And I thought by telling his story, people would, number one, get a better understanding of him, have a better understanding of his pastor, and understand that lives are complicated. And by, by having a chance to tell it in his words rather than seeing how it's caught up on cable news and sound bites that we're running painfully around the clock, uh, people might be prepared to listen in a way that you don't listen when your feelings aren't raw. And I, I think one of the president's many gifts is his ability at times of crisis or times where people are you know, perplexed and frustrated to add a voice of explanation to it and to tell a story in a way that touches people's hearts. And I knew he could do that, and so I encouraged him to do what he wanted to do all along. Did you take any part in helping him draft it? No, he wrote that speech, every word himself. It was such a personal story, and anyone 
who didn't hear it, I, I really uh, recommend, it was one of, I keep joking with him, I say it's in the top five, but I think I have about 20 now in the top five. <laughs> but it's truly in the top five, because it was profoundly personal. And I was, I sat in the audience uh, next to the First Lady when he gave his speech, and it just, it moved me to tears, even though I knew the story, but just his willingness to just hold himself totally um, raw and open for people to make their own judgments. And th that takes a lot of nerve, it takes a lot of guts. And being willing to just confront something as painful as that, um, I was really proud of him that day. It was a good, it was a good speech, amazing. top five. Amazing. So one of the saddest moments that I can recall during this administration was President Obama's press conference after the Sandy Hook shootings in 2012. Um, the shooter killed 20 children in a classroom, six and seven-year-olds, and additionally killed seven adults uh, using a semi-automatic rifle. So President Obama had tears running down his face as he addressed the nation about this horrendous mass murder. So we've had so many incidents of gun violence before that and since that. In Orlando, there was the biggest mass shooting by a single shooter in American history. So at that press conference, we saw the president appear to me to be weary, saddened, and angry. Uh, so with just six months left in the administration, and I don't say that happily, by the way, uh, and with the NRA not backing down on any form of gun control, and with the sit-in uh, happening now, I guess we're in eight hours into it, what, if anything, can the president do in these next six months, and what have you advised him to do? Well, I think the question is now not what the president can do, but what can you do? Because this isn't going to change without you. There you go. And um, I mean, you mentioned Sandy Hook. I, just last week, I was at a fundraiser for Sandy Hook Promise, which is an organization that several of the parents of the children who were murdered that day have formed to try to go into our schools and help young people identify their classmates who were in crisis and to know how to handle that situation because so often after this happens, you hear people say, well, I knew that there was something wrong, but I didn't do anything about it. And so, it's, and so they're tra taking this enormously tragic event in their lives and trying to help other children. And it was the worst day of the administration. Um, it was really two days, the day that we found out what happened. And I was in the Oval Office when he found out the number of children. And I, I just, I couldn't even process the number 20. And anyone who has children, you know that at age six or seven, they are just as precious as they can be. And uh, we went up to Newtown two days later for a memorial service. And I will never forget him walking around and he spent time with each family and they had photographs of the children and they had, there was one set of twins and the twin was holding up the photograph with her twin and it just, it was just gut-wrenching and the country was prepared to take action. And keep in mind, the action that we proposed was simply to ensure that everyone who buys a lethal weapon goes through a background check. No infringement on the Second Amendment. I mean, everyone keeps talking about the Second Amendment. We have a Second Amendment freedom of speech, but you can't cry fire in a crowded theater. I mean, there are limitations on all of our rights to ensure public safety. For heaven, heavens to Betsy, as my grandmother would say, how could we not have sensible background checks? And what we found is, is that now um, gun dealers and folks who are selling over the internet are basically circumventing the background check process and the registration process required. And all we wanted to do was to make sure that we capture all of that. And so if you pass a background check, then you can have access to a gun. Now, I will say most recently, we did get uh, what we call We the People petition asking about assault, assault weapons. And it's our view that we shouldn't have assault weapons available either. Uh, they're really dangerous. They, they truly are common sense reforms that we've been asking for. And so um, you're right, right now, led by Congressman John Lewis and the other members on the House are doing a sit-in. And you know, John Lewis is just a fine, fine man. He's a civil rights leader. He is decent to his core. And he has just had enough. 
and he doesn't know what else to do other than just sit there and um, demonstrate until he can get his colleagues on, in the Republican side of the House to come and just do their jobs and figure it out. And the problem is, as you mentioned, the NRA has decided to do what's called score this issue. And I never knew what that word was until I got to Washington. But basically, if you vote in favor of keeping people who are on the terrorist watch list from getting guns, so they can't get on a plane, but right now they can get a gun, and we're just simply saying, let's go through a process where we don't let them have a gun, they can appeal it, they can go in and prove that they should be entitled to have a gun, but the NRA has decided that if you vote in favor of that, then they're gonna mark that against you and work hard to defeat you uh, when you're up for re-election, and they have a lot of money, and they have a lot of influence, and the only thing that's going to be a counterbalance to that is truly you. It's the American people. And so we are seeing mobilization happening around the country. People are taking to social media. They are encouraging their elected officials um, to, to do the right thing. And I can't ask you to lobby, but I can say that when your voices are heard loudly and clearly, that's going to be when, when you care as much about keeping our children safe as the NRA does about making weapons available to every single person, that's when change will happen, and not until then. So it's not the president, it's you. Never in the history of this country has the U.S. Senate refused to hold a confirmation hearing for a president's nominee to the How Supreme How about Court that? Until now. Until now. Until now. So what is your take, Valerie, on the Senate's refusal to give a hearing to Merrick Garland? He's the chief judge of the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Second highest court yes. of the land. He's been um, on that bench for 19 years, chief judge for three. He was just evaluated by the ABA, given the absolute highest evaluation you can possibly have from the American Bar Association. There isn't a single person who has doubted his qualifications. But the night Justice Scalia died, uh, Senator McConnell announced that there would be no hearing, there would be no vote, there would be nothing, without even knowing who the president was going to select. His rationale was, it's an election year. And we should let the people decide. And our view is, the people decided when they elected the president to a four-year term. <laughs> Elections really do matter, and oftentimes you hear in the course of campaigns, people talk about, well, the president gets to appoint a person to the Supreme Court, and it makes a big difference. And I wish I could say that I was surprised. But frankly, since day one, we have seen the Republicans take the position that their best chance is to try to prevent the president from moving forward with his agenda. And that's putting their short-term political interests ahead of you ahead of what's good for our country. And it has happened time and time and time again. I think we had over 50 some odd votes to repeal the Affordable Care Act. We shut down the federal government over the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, which anyone who knows the president knows he was never going to do. Uh, but they were, you know, that's what they decided to do. And so this is just one more in a continuum. And having a court split, potentially 4-4, creates uncertainty. It's not good for our country, and it is absolutely without precedent. In fact, just so fun facts to have, the last time this issue came up where a judge was confirmed in an election year was when President Reagan nominated now Justice Kennedy to the Supreme Court. And uh, then now Vice President Biden was chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, the Senate voted for Justice Kennedy, then Judge Kennedy, 93 to zero, in an election year, and the icing on the cake is, Senator McConnell cast a vote in favor. So if it was okay then, why is it not okay now? I don't know. What uh -huh. do you think? Yeah. Politics. Right. Politics. Politics, come on. And I'm smiling, but I'm really, I'm really not. I mean, it is, just, it is just obscene to have the highest court of the land be hijacked like this. Uh, simply because we have an election going on. We're supposed to be able to do our jobs until the job is done and they're not doing theirs. So a little more on the Supreme Court. Did you have any input into uh, President Obama's selection of Merrick Garland? And do you have input, did you have input on his other 
uh, nominees. Yeah, um, the president's senior advisors go through a process that hit under his supervision, obviously in direction, to cast a net whenever there is a vacancy. And so for each of the Supreme Court um, judges, justices who he's put on the bench, I have had the ability to participate in the process. And it's, a, it's an amazing process. You learn a lot about people, both in terms of their backgrounds and also their stem. And I mean, if you just think about Judge Garland, we learned so much about him, but the fact that he was willing to put himself through what he right. knew would be just horrible, you, it says something about his character and his integrity and his desire to serve the public. And meeting him and, and also meeting, I met his daughter. He has a daughter who volunteers teaching in the prisons while she's in college. And I said to him, aren't you proud of her? And he said, yes, I am. And I thought, well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So not only are his credentials exemplary, not only has he had a long and stellar career on the bench, he has a reputation for being a consensus builder, forges ways of finding that common ground so that opinions can reach as close to a majority, not just a majority, but a unanimous decision as possible. Uh, and he's a really good guy, and he's a great dad, and he's a great husband, and there's no earthly reason why he would have to go through this experience. Uh, but thank goodness he's willing to do it. We owe him a lot, a great a debt of gratitude. This is the Commonwealth Club of California program, and we're talking to Valerie Jarrett, Senior Advisor to President Barack Obama. I am Ladaris Cordell, your moderator. Commonwealth Club programs are on the radio, and you can see our program videos on our YouTube channel. And catch up with us on our website, Facebook, and Twitter. So. Let's switch up a little bit here and do a lightning round. Oh. Uh, here's what I mean by that. So in other words, I mean, the pace my answers have been too long. I get it. No, okay. no, no. I get it. Not at all. Not at all. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. So what I want to do is give you 10 questions on random topics, truly random. And then I'd like you to give us just your 10 second response to each one. OK, just random. Truly random. Truly, truly, truly random. random. All right, here we go. Are you sure? Sure. Um, uh, who is your favorite singer? Prince. Prince. Wow. Oh, yes. So sad. So sad. I'm heartbroken. I'm yeah. telling you, I saw him in 1984. Dressed, I was dressed in purple. He was too. <laughs> purple Rain concert. Rosemont Horizon in Chicago. Oh my gosh. And then for my 50th birthday in Las Vegas, I just, I love, I, and he came to the White House too. I mean, he just, what an incredibly talented man. I could speak to you at great length for a very long oh, time. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Moving right along. Number two, what is, your, what is your favorite place to travel outside of the US? Just about anywhere. I love to travel. Is that right? I, I, I have I'm not a met a that. country I haven't found something interesting about. So everywhere. What is the best part of working with President Obama? Service, truly, service, yeah. What is the best part of working with Michelle Obama? Oh man, she is incredible. Just, she is a force to be reckoned with, so being in her presence, yeah. it's about us, it's cool. It's what cool. is the most difficult part of parenting? I understand Where you have a perfect begin? child. I do. Right? That's what I've heard. She right? is absolutely perfect. perfect. She's also 30. So they say little kids, little problems, big kids, bigger problems. But she's an adult now. And I suppose, I think the hardest part is learning that uh, you have to let go. You have to let them <laughs> grow up. I think one of the worst days of my life was when I dropped her off at college. I'll never forget that look on her face when she turned around and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to stand there and cry and crumble before my very eyes? And I called my mother from the car as I was sobbing. And she said, that means you did a good job. You got to be able to let them go. Right. And so see, and then the other piece of it is, um, when you see, you have to let them make some decisions on their own. And sometimes you don't agree with those decisions, but you just, you have to let them do it anyway. They are their own people, but when they're born, you think, I own this thing, I made this thing. <laughs> I get to keep it always. <laughs> Not so. Great. Okay, great. Uh, would you have liked to have been a twin? I told you this is random. This is random. She's asking an only child if I would like to be a twin. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, name uh, two of your favorite writers. All right, that's a little more interesting. So two of my many favorite. Um, I would say Harper Lee with a qualification in that I have read To Kill a Mockingbird a thousand times. I cherish every word. I didn't read her other book because I did not want it to diminish how I felt about her. And then I think um, in terms of nonfiction, I think Doris Kearns Goodwin. I really like her a lot, and I've learned a lot about history from her books, and she tells a story in a really powerful way. Okay. That's two. I'll okay. stop there. Great. Um, what do you do to relax? <sighs> relax? <laughs> <laughs> do people relax? <laughs> I come here and I talk to the commonwealth. That's what I do. Let's relax. <laughs> You know, um, what, I do, what I do is I have the good fortune of some dear friends who I've had for my entire life and a great family. You've heard a little bit about my parents, but because I'm an only child, uh, my, my extended family is really very important to me. They're like siblings, and we were all raised together. And so um, on Sundays, I have a group of my girlfriends, two of who are also my cousins, and we have brunch every Sunday. And we laugh and we talk and we do not discuss my work. We can discuss their work if they want to, but we do not discuss my work at all. And we'll have like a three-hour lunch, and then it's followed by dinner with my family who Very live nice. in Washington. And it just centers me and grounds me for the week. And that's fun that's for me. That's, that's very relaxing. Terrific. What is the best advice you ever got? Well, I told you about that law firm, right? So um, I think the best advice I got for, from a dear friend who I just saw a couple days ago in Chicago, and he said, you know, when you are miserable, it's your life and you should change it. And you should listen to that voice inside of you that's often very quiet. And uh, don't, don't live somebody else's life. Live your own and have the, kind of the courage enough to take a leap of faith and do something different. And if he had not pushed me hard, like really nudged me, I might not have ever decided to uh, join the public sector where I found so much satisfaction. And I may, who knows, I may not have ever met the Obamas either. Mm -hmm. And it was really good advice. I know too many people who just put up with kind of a mediocre existence. And um, don't choose mediocrity. Good. Choose excellence. Right. Last one. Who will play you in the movie? <laughs> we had this conversation as a joke ahead of time. So after much thought and deliberation, I'm going to go with Kerry Washington. Yeah. I like it. I can, I can see that. Absolutely. So She's familiar with the White House. Oh, yes. <laughs> so while you have worked for politicians, you mentioned Mayor Washington, Mayor Daley, and the president, you have never run for elected office. No. So yet, your political intuition and savvy are legend. So to what and or to whom do you attribute your political smarts? Living long enough, I suppose. <laughs> Truly, truly. Um, well, maybe it's my psychology degree from Stanford. That could be it as well. <laughs> it has really come in handy. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think the experiences that I had working for a city government in Chicago were invaluable. They really were. Because uh, when you're in local government, you are on the ground and you are looking into the eyes and the hearts of the people who you are there to serve. And you, it teaches you to listen. It teaches you to to um, in be expansive in the people with whom you talk to. And I think that that engagement gives you political judgment. Uh, and then kind of having a really good moral compass, which I attribute to my parents. And I think the two together, experience and that moral compass work out well. Because it's, it's really not political judgment. It's kind of life judgment. And you want your politicians to reflect you. And so making sure that those two are firmly linked and grounded, I think, is uh, something that I got beginning with childhood and then those early years in government. So when this administration ends, I assume, or I shouldn't assume, will you return to your hometown of Chicago? And if so, uh, is running for public office in your future? I think I pretty much surely will go home, and then I will go to sleep. <laughs> and then we'll figure out what to do after that. 
I just, it's impossible to think right now about what to do beyond looking to find out whether John Lewis is still on the floor in the house. I mean, it's just, there's so, this, this job is so all-consuming as it should be, as you, your taxpayer dollars are counting on it being. And so, I don't know, I can't figure it out. We'll see. Do you think that Michelle Obama should run for office, and do you think she will? Um, I know she won't. Uh, she'd be a terrific whatever she decided to be. But she does not have, the, the, polit the political part, the politics part of government um, is enormously frustrating to her. And, uh, but she'd be a terrific, terrific leader. And she will do great in whatever she does next. But I can give you 100% assurance she will She's not, never not for run for elected office. So given the rough and tumble of politics these days, and, and rough and tumble is really an understatement, um, how do we get more women to run for office? Right now, there are 20 women in the Senate. That's 20%. There's some snapping going on out there. Yes, is, yes. There's 84 women in the House. That's just about 19%. So what, what needs to be done? You guys have to run for office. Well, <laughs> you really do. And we have to encourage young people to get in, engaged generally. So this is like my pitch for just public engagement. And the president was saying recently there was a little girl who was videotaped by her grandmother crying about the president leaving office. Some of you may have seen it. She was <laughs> yeah. going, it's too soon. It's too soon. <laughs> and I showed it to him. And he said, call her and tell her it's not too soon because I will assume the most important office, and that's the office of citizenship. And I think uh, what I really try to, when I talk to young women in particular, is to say, get in the arena. Is it is it hard? Yes. Is it painful? Yes. Do you have to learn to turn off your Twitter feed? Most definitely. <laughs> Most definitely. Are you misunderstood and you know, described in ways that you might find unflattering? Yeah, yeah. But none of that compares to the enormous reward of feeling as though you're a part of something bigger than yourself and you're giving back to a community, whether it's a school board or a city council or running for mayor or governor or even president. Uh, you notice I didn't mention members of Congress, but I really wish women would run for Congress. If, if more women were in Congress, I promise you, we would get a lot more done. That's true. That's true. We would. Yeah. We would. Yeah. We would. <laughs> you once said this about the Obamas. I just worry a lot. I'm a worrier. I am a worrier. Michelle and Barack are really dear to me. I mean, I love them, and I don't want them to see them hurt. I get hurt. Just the nature of politics is har hurtful. So every time they are hurt, I get hurt. It's a lot to ask of people, and it's a lot to see your friends go through. It's hard not to get emotional. So the Obamas, I mean, they, they, they seem confident, deeply in love with one another, and they appear to not let all this craziness get to them. So how do the Obamas handle the hurt from all yeah. the vitriol and the name calling, and how do you handle their hurt? Yeah, so I think they have the advantage of being very well grounded. And they love each other. They have a circle of friends around them that love them unconditionally and who they've been friends with for a long time and some a short time. They made some new friends in Washington, too. Um, they have Mrs. Robinson, uh, the First Lady's mom, who was terrific to, to move to Washington and to take such great care of the girls. And so their nuclear family, including her, is really strong and steady and grounded and protective. And I think that they spend a lot of time with each other and with the people who they love and who love them. And that provides you, all of us, with a, a, a buffer and a cushion against some of the hate. And they actually, they know who they are. They understand that um, there is a machine out there that's kind of a toxic machine. I mean, we often joke that if we watched Fox all day, well, we wouldn't think much of e ourselves either. My goodness, <laughs> we would be unrecognizable. Be like, Are you really that person? My goodness. So you, but you have to laugh at it because, because the reason why you don't take a lot of it too seriously is because the people who are saying it don't know you. They don't know a thing about you, and they're just, you know, mimicking what they've heard somewhere else, or they're afraid, or they're. Uh, and they see their lives changing and our society changing, and there are a whole host of reasons for it. Um, and it, one thing about it, though, that, and so I think we've learned to cope. I, I think that quote must have been for a while, a, a while ago, because I think we've all 
developed a tougher skin. And one of the strengths of the president is, is that he truly does not lose his focus for true north. And he has this uncanny ability to say, OK, that's where we're headed. And that's a good place. And it's going to take people a while to, to maybe appreciate the decisions that I'm making. But in the end, if it's a good thing, it will be worth it. And so you have to learn how to absorb a lot of pain, quite frankly. And recognize that if you know each day that you're doing the best you can, and yeah, we make mistakes, everybody makes mistakes, and you try to be self-critical, and you figure out, well, what can I do differently? But you just have to, um, you just have to be resilient. And I tell this to people all the time. You know, life, it's not my mom, this is my mom's quote. I'm giving you a lot of quotes today. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do about it. And so each day you have to get up and you have to just be back at it again and be back and just be relentless and just not give up. And, um, and you can't let the bad guys get the better of you. And so you just absorb that pain. And yeah, it, it hurts, but pain hurts. That's what pain is all about. Uh, but you just figure out ways of replenishing yourself. And then results. I mean, the fact of the matter, I think the country is far better off seven and a half years later than it was when the president took office. And there is just no better um, reward than that kind of success. Great. So it's time now for our audience Ooh, question period. Now you all come oh, in. Oh, I have a number of questions here. So let's begin. Uh, Be gentle. Uh, I shall. <laughs> These are very gentle questions, by the way. What books uh, are, is the, are the president is the president reading currently? You know, I don't know. He is uh, just an avid reader, and he digests them like amazing, with amazing speed. What was that name? Eleanor Woods? Was that the speed reading class? That we used yeah. to? He can <laughs> speed his way through a book like you don't know. Yeah. But I, I, that's a question I could find out huh. and answer to you. All right. In well, any given day, he's probably reading about five or ten different books. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Will you be writing a book? You know, P please. I, I don't know the answer to that question because I think the kind of book that people would, the, the kind of book that would sell is not the kind of book I would write. And I mean, I've had this in, incredible privilege of um, being in the room. If anybody's seen the play Hamilton, it's like you want to be in the room when it happens. Well, I'm in the room. And I think being in the room, you owe the president your silence mm -hmm. and your loyalty. And I'm kind of down on people who write books, like these tell-all books, mm -hmm. because you had the opportunity to say whatever you wanted to say when you were there. You should speak up when you have that privilege, and then after that, hush up. <laughs> um, but I might write a book about lessons I've learned. That I might do, because it would be like a way of having many, many years of experience and then trying to figure out a way of making life a little bit easier for the next generation. So that I might do Fantastic. after I sleep. Yes, <laughs> right. Sleep is coming first. Please share the most effective ways an individual or group can support passing effective gun control legislation. Well, we talked about that. I think it has to really be um, um, a two things. It has to be a grassroots effort similar to like um, the disability community that led to the passage of ADA. It was a grassroots effort all across our country, or Mothers Against Drunk Driving, another grassroots effort all across our country. But then it also has to be a force that is strong enough to um, go against the NRA. And they have a lot of money. And some of it comes from the gun manufacturers. Some of it comes from gun owners who just you know, send in that check all the time. And they've been doing it for a long time now. They have a head start on us. And so we have to get organized really quickly. And there are business leaders like Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of um, New York, who has made this his passion and has put his money where his mouth is. And it's going to take a lot more of that um, in order to affect change that we talked about. What are you going to miss most about working at the White House? Hmm. The people. The people. I mean, I, there's just nothing better than working with people that you respect and love. And we spend, as you would imagine, a lot of hours together every day. And uh, it's, it's a sense of being a part, again, as I said much earlier, of being a part of something bigger than yourself and, and sorting through 
naughty, naughty problems together. Naughty, na not naughty, naughty, like nights. <laughs> night um, and just trying to figure out how to make the best informed decision that's going to help the most amount of people possible. And the people with whom you do that with, you develop this incredibly special bond. And so um, I'm used to seeing them all day long every day, and I'll miss them, and I'll miss the place. It's a really cool place to work. Good. I mean, I drive in through those gates every single day, and I, I will tell you a, a quick story, because I tell it all the time, and I just, I love this guy. When um, the president was running in his first term, uh, as you might remember, the primary season lasted forever, similarly to this one. And uh, when he was in Texas, he was still running, and he'd hoped the primary would be over by then. It wasn't. And we were, uh, he was doing debates. He hated the debates during the primary, because it's really hard to debate when you basically agree with people about most things. Um, and you know you're going to end up having to support them, whoever wins. And so you, can, you have to be kind of careful. Anyway, we're in an elevator and uh, leaving Austin, Texas. And there was an older black gentleman who'd been operating our elevator during the three days that we were there. And when we were, we were leaving, he, uh, it was like 7.30 in the morning, and it was raining, and the president had a cold, and he was kind of grumpy. And so this guy, so we're all being very quiet. And uh, so this gentleman says, sir, I'd like to give you something. And I think to myself, oh, this is not a time for a conversation. Let's just get going. And, but we're no, I'm nosy, and not we're nosy, I'm nosy. So I look to see what he wanted to give him, and it was a patch from his military uniform. And exactly. So the then senator realized what it was and said, oh, sir, I couldn't possibly accept that. And they go back and forth and back and forth. And finally, this gentleman clears his throat and he said, sir, I have carried this patch with me every day for 40 years. It's kept me safe. It's given me strength. And I want you to have it. And it was such a moment of a person just giving away a treasured possession to a stranger in the hope it would bring him good luck. So I burst into tears in this elevator. <laughs> I mean, not like a little tear down, you know, I could brush it off, no, but burst into tears. And a friend of the president's was with me. He burst into tears. I think the agents had little tears in their eyes too. We were all like, oh my gosh. And so later in the day, I said to the president, what did you do with that patch? That, you know, and this was before people kept giving, started giving him like their firstborn child. <laughs> I've seen people hand him their babies in rope lines and it's like, it's dangerous, don't do that. <laughs> so I digress. So <laughs> he says to me, Valerie, he says, I put it in my pocket. And I go, typical man. <laughs> I didn't mean like, where did you put it physically? I meant, how did it make you feel that this stranger is giving you his lifelong possession? And this is like an insight into our relationship. He goes, Valerie, I put it in my pocket. And so then he proceeds to reach in his pocket and he pulls out all of these trinkets in his pocket. And he tells me the story about each one, who gave it to him, where they were, what the circumstances were, and why it was so special that he put it in his pocket. And so the reason that's relevant is, is that every day when we drive through the gates in the White House, I think about that man. And it just makes me say, do something in the course of the day to make him proud of you. And I didn't know his name at all. I didn't know I didn't know anything about him, and then I, but I tell this story all the time, and so a Washington Post reporter heard it, and at the end of the first term, she said, I want to track him down, and I'll tell you that my first instinct was, what if he turns out to be like an ax murderer? Don't track him. <laughs> I've been thinking about him every day. I don't want to know anything about him. I really don't. I like my fantasy of him. <laughs> Long story short, she tracked him down. His name is Earl Smith. He's head of security for the Hyatt Hotel in Austin, Texas. And so I tell the president, I said, do you remember that guy? This is now four years later. I said, four plus years later, I said, from Austin, military patch? He goes, yeah, pocket. I told you I put him in the pocket. <laughs> and so I said, this reporter found him. And so he said, invite him to my inauguration. Second inauguration. So he came, and then, this, and then the day after the inauguration, he invited Earl Smith to the White House, to the Oval Office, shook his hand, and Earl gave him a salute. And I cried again. I cried again. 
That's a great stuff. Those are great stories. Yeah, that story, isn't Wonderful it? stories. I love that story. So, so what recommendations to the president are you most proud of? Maybe two or three? You know, one of the, um, you're not going to like this answer, I don't suppose, but part of what makes the White House work is that there is this cone of trust. And um, we don't talk about what happens like in the room. And the reason why is, is that it's really, it's about him. And we're clear on that, and we're staff, and he's the president. And this isn't about anyone who works for him ever taking credit, because ultimately, the reason his job can be lonely is, is that he makes the decisions. And he lives with them, and sometimes they're life and death decisions. And what um, I pride myself on, and uh, the rest of the team with whom I work now, uh, is that we just don't ever talk about, like, I said to do this, or I said to do that. Um, we don't really share the advice that we share with him. He gets to be the sole beneficiary, and he takes it, or sometimes he leaves it. What, if anything, can be done to move forward with the Supreme Court nominee, do you think? Well, we are going to continue to push our campaign in the states where we think it will hurt. And we're seeing already all of the polling indicates, state by state, that the American people who are basically fair and who can look at his credentials, Judge Garland's credentials, and see, yes, he'd be a great Supreme Court justice. And everyone says, give him a hearing. And so what we really, we're pushing this step by step. First, we wanted the Republicans to at least meet with him. And I am heartened to say that several who originally demurred have now agreed and have met with him and have come out of those meetings and said quite positive things about him. And the next step is to say, well, if you've met with him privately, then why wouldn't you have a hearing where you could ask him whatever questions you want in a public setting so you, the American people, could hear the answers and the questions too? And so that's what we're really pushing for now. And so to the degree your voices are heard, that you think that this is an important issue, I think that's a good thing. And it's an opportunity for people to really understand a little bit more about the Supreme Court and why it's so important. A few weeks ago, I invited in a group of civics teachers. They taught eighth grade and high school civics. And they were all perplexed. They're like, what do we teach our students? Because they're acting so irresponsibly. It's not a very good role model for the young people who are coming right. along. But it is an opportunity for everyone to understand the importance of following the rules and what the consequences are when they don't. Well, we have reached the point in our program where there's time for only one last question. But oh. before I ask it, I will tell you, I think you're a terrific storyteller. And, That's a good label. And uh, when you, we talked about names, yes. uh, my name for you, in fact, I think is the, the, the best one is First Friend. I think you are a terrific friend. That's to the nice. Obamas. Thank you. Absolutely. That's a good one. I'll take that one. Good. So here is our, our final question. Whoever is elected next president, what advice would you give to him or her? <laughs> Whoever it might be, the advice I would give them is just never lose sight of why you're there. And you can, you know, a lot comes at you in the course of the day, and part of the responsibility of the president is to surround himself with people who he trusts, delegate appropriately, uh, but drive an agenda that is one that is inclusive and that reflects America as a whole. And I think whoever the president is has to keep foremost in his and her mind to whom they're accountable, and that's to you. Valerie Jarrett. Yes. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks, Doug. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It was fun. It was fun. Thank you so I enjoyed much. myself. Thank you. Awesome. You can interview me anytime. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. Oh. Now I have to stand up. Thank you. Thank you.